Welcome to Drive the DAF. Clear, structured explanation of the daily DAF in 20 minutes. You can even follow in the car. Primarily discusses the halacha of pouring water into a chatzar in a situation where that water may run out into Rosh Hashanah and then you've created a situation where you're transferring water from uh, Rosh Hashanah to a Rosh Hashanah which could be a potential Iser. The Gemara gives us a brief preview of that in the beginning of the daf. Then the Gemara uh, continues, it, it concludes its comments on the previous mission discussing drawing water by means of hanging walls. And then we get to the mission which introduces the topic of the pouring of the water. So first of all, as far as pouring the water, we had seen a halacha in our Mishnah previously. We had seen that you're allowed to draw water from a body of water by way of a hole with walls surrounding it, such that the hole is four t'vachim by four t'vachim, and the walls are ten t'vachim, even though it's suspended far above the water. So Rav Huna says there, um, there's a difference between drawing water and pouring water. Now, there's two versions of this Gemara. What exactly Rav... Uh, what exactly Rabbi Barav Huna said. According to the first version, he said, pouring water is usher. According to the second version, he said it's permitted. Now, the Gemara compares pouring water into the ocean here, or into a body of water, to a situation where you're pouring water out into the chaser. That, we'll see in the Mishnah coming up, that's permitted. So the Gemara wants to know, according to the version where Rav Huna said to pour into the water is usher, why is it different than there? And according to the version that he said it's permitted, what's the Chiddush? Why would I think it's different than there? That you need to tell me that it's the same. So the Gemara says that the difference, either real or um, uh, what you may have thought, is that the water that's poured into a chutzar stops. It gets absorbed into the ground. It doesn't flow necessarily out into a shusar abim. Even if it ends up flowing, it's not what you intended. You didn't think it was going to happen, and therefore it's not a problem. It's not a malacha. However, if you're pouring it into the water, into a body of water, it's going to mix with the rest of the water, and it'll definitely flow out beyond your walls, beyond your mechitzas, from the shusar yachid, into the space beyond it, which is a karmelis. So according to Rav... Uh, Rabba's first version, he's saying that that's usher for that reason. And according to the second version, he's saying that that's permitted, even though that may happen, but it's still mutter. Uh, you don't have to be choshish for that, because that's not your intent. Okay, now the Gemara continues commenting on the Mishnah. The Mishnah had said that if you have two porches built into the side of a building, and the upper porch made... Uh, hanging walls to be able to draw water and the lower porch uses the upper porch's walls, then you need to have an air of chatzeris. If you don't have an air of chatzeris they're both forbidden to use it. The Gemara now quotes Rav Huna, the name of Rav, that says that's only if the two porches are near each other horizontally. Laterally they're close to each other. If however they're spaced, four to home apart, then it's considered too difficult for the lower one to use the upper one. He has to actually, besides for throwing the bucket upwards to get to the upper porch and down through the hole, he has to actually go sideways as well. And therefore it's not considered his property. It's not considered his rishus. And the one who lives in the upper porch has exclusive rights, so he doesn't need to have an air of chatzeris. So the Gemara says this fits with Rav's opinion that throwing something laterally is considered to be a difficult task and it minimizes your uh, access to that. Okay, now the Gemara quotes a statement of Rabbah and Rabbi Chibar Yosef, and it's self contradictory. The statement says there is theft on Shabbos, and a Chorva, a ruined house, returns theft to its owner. Now, what this means, at least according to Gemara's understanding, there is theft on Shabbos means that if somebody has, if you have two people that have a ruined property between them, it belongs to one of them, but the other one generally uses it. He uses it all the time. Um, the one who owns it doesn't use it that much. The one who doesn't own it uses it often. So it's kind of like he's stealing this property that's between their two houses. Now, as far as Shabbos is concerned, there is theft. There is theft means that he becomes the owner. He has stolen it, and as far as Hilcha Shabbos is concerned, he's considered the owner, and he is viewed as if he has legal rights to it, because he does use it, and therefore he has to join an Erev Chatseris, and the original owner can't use it. Now that's contradictory to the second half of the statement, which says that the Chorva returns to the owner. It returns to... Uh, the owner seems to imply that it belongs fully to the to the actual uh, title holder, and the one who's using it does not have a right. So the Gemara asks, it's a self-contradictory statement. The Gemara says the first half of the statement doesn't mean that he he's the owner and therefore he has rights to it, and he has to join the heir of Chaseris. It means he is... There is theft. It means he has to return it. He has to 
give it back to the original owner. He doesn't have legal rights, and therefore he's not considered an owner, and you do not have to make an Erev The Gemara says, well, now this seems to be contradicted by the case of the two porches, because why does a person on the lower porch have a right to use the upper porch to the extent that the upper porch guy has to make an Erev with him? What do you mean? The porch belongs to the upper guy. It doesn't belong to the lower guy. What's he doing there? Gemara says the case is where the lower porch owner joined in the expenses of building the walls, and therefore there was the hanging walls which permit the water drawing, he paid for that as well. So he says, well, if he paid for that as well, then he's a part owner. If he's a part owner, so how come the case of the mission where we say he has to join is only if the walls are in the upper courtyard, the upper porch, and not the lower porch, even if there's walls in the lower porch, as long as he joined in the expenses to build the walls for the upper porch, he has rights there. And therefore, you should have to have an heir of Chaseris, even if he has his own wall and his own hanging mechitzas in his own hole in his lower porch. To that, the Gemara answers, if he goes ahead later and he builds his own mechitzas in his own porch, that's considered like he's removing himself from his rights in the previous porch, and therefore he doesn't have to join that Erev Chatzeris. Okay, that concludes this Gemara. Now we go to the mission which discusses the halacha of pouring water into a yard. First of all, what do we mean when we say water? It's waste water. It could either be just dirty water that was used to wash, to clean, to bathe, whatever it is, or it could be referring to actual sewage. Either way, it was customarily poured into a yard, and the concern is that it'll flow out beyond the walls of the Chatzer into the Rosh Rabim. Now, if you intend for it to stay in the Chatzer and it goes by itself, that's not Usr. That's, uh, it's not called Malachas Machshev, it's not what you intended it to happen. And even if it does happen, it's not what you wanted, and you really didn't pour it into the Rosh Rabim, you poured it into your own Chatzer. It flowed out by itself. Therefore, there, that would not be Usr. That would actually be Mutter. The problem is that sometimes it will flow. There's another problem that if it flows too strongly, people will see it coming out and assume you poured it directly into Rishas Zarab, and we don't want that to happen. So, the Mishnah um, is structured as follows. It first quotes a halacha, then it brings the Machlokas of Rabbi Lezab and Yaakov and the Chachamim, and it's not clear who said the first phrase of the Mishnah. We'll have to analyze that in the Gemara itself. So, first of all, the Gemara says the following, the Mishnah begins with this halacha. If the courtyard is less than four amas by four amas, you're not allowed to pour waste water into it on Shabbos because it'll flow out. If it is larger, if it is four amas, and here it doesn't say four amas by four amas, it just says four amas, it doesn't say the other dimension. The assumption is that it's four by four. So then uh, you can't pour, you are allowed to pour the water out into the chatzar, and if it flows into the Rishas Rabbim, it's not a problem. The Gemara will explain why. The Gemara says, what should you do if you have a chatzah that's too small? You have to make a cesspool. You have to create a hole in the gr- in the floor. And the cesspool has a drainage hole at the top of it so that it can drain out the overflow. You have to have uh, the the actual cesspool that you make has to be able to fit at least two sa of water below that drainage hole. That's the standard amount of wastewater that people produce in one day. So you won't produce more than that on Shabbos. Now, the anonymous part of the Mishnah continues, and it says that there are actually circumstances in which you're allowed to pour water, wastewater, directly into Rishas Rabbim itself. How's that? If you have a cesspool in Rishas Rabbim, the cesspool is not technically a halachic Rishas Rabbim. It's technically a Malcolm Patur. Um, that's because it's 10 Tvachim deep, and it's uh, wide, but it's not really 4 Tvachim wide, or it's not a full 10 Tvachim deep. So it's a separate Rishas. Um... We want it to stay a Malkim Pator. We're afraid that it's going to return, that it'll turn into Rosh Harabim by being filled up. So, and there'll be a collection of dirt and stuff at the bottom of it. So what do we want to do? You have to cover the hole. And that way, when you pour into it, it'll be mostly empty. You won't have dirt falling in. You'll, you have to lay a plank of wood over it. And then you could pour on the plank of wood, and then from there into the hole... And the hole will stay primarily clean. You won't have a buildup in there because of the cover that's on it. And therefore, you're pouring into a makam p'tor. That's fine. You are only pouring from a shosh into a makam p'tor. That's not a problem. If you don't cover it, it'll end up being pouring into a shosh directly. Okay. Now, the Gemara goes into this machlekes uh, between Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov and the Chachamim. Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov says, if you have a trench to drain your waste water out of the chatzar, um, and the trench runs into Rishos Harabim, you cover the first four Amos of Rishos Harabim. Um, the Chachamim say that you can't pour into a trench even if it's a hundred Amos long. 
Now, what's the reason for this? Rabbi Lozer ben Yaakov says it's okay because the water is most likely going to be absorbed in the four amas lent that's covered. Nobody will see it. It'll be absorbed. Even if it goes further, fine. You didn't intend for it to. You wanted it to be collected in the trench and absorbed into the ground, and therefore we don't need to worry about that. The Chachamim, however, say no. It still may come out with force, and people in Rishasar will see it coming out, and they'll think you poured water directly into Rishasar and they'll learn that that's permitted, when in fact it's an Isra Dairaisa. Now, the Chachamim therefore say what you can do is pour it on your roof or pour it on the cover, and then it drops into the trench. Then it'll come out softly because it doesn't have the force of your original. Uh, throwing of the water, and therefore it won't come out strong, and people won't see it. Now, the mission continues, and it says that if you have a portico, or a pavilion of some sort, next to your chatzar, that counts towards the 4 by 4 amas, which we need in order to make a minimum size. Um, if you have two buildings across from each other, two upper floors, and they each want to pour into a chatzar between them, so the halacha is, um, that you have to have a cesspool. If some of them made the cesspool and the other ones did not, it's only allowed to be used by the people who made it. It cannot be shared by the others. Now, the uh, Gemara will explain all these halachas step by step. First of all, the Gemara wants to know where well, you said that you're only allowed to pour uh, wastewater into a chatzar that has four amas by four amas without a cesspool. If it's, too, if it's smaller than that, you have to build a cesspool. What's the reason? Why should I care? It may flow into Rishas Rabbim. Anyway, what difference does it make what the size is? How come it's not a problem if it flows out if it's a minimum of four amas by four amas? So it's a machlekes between Rabba and Rabbi Zera. Rabba says that as long as the chatzar is large enough, you want to use it. If you want to use it, you care that it shouldn't be full of dust and dirt flying all over the place. And therefore, you want water there to settle the dust. If you want water there, well, you really want the water to stay inside the chatzar. If you want it to stay in the chatzar, then if it flows out, it's against your will, and therefore it's not usher. However, if it's too small, you don't care, and you don't want the water to stay there in the chatzar. You're happy for it to flow outwards. And then, when it does flow out into Rosh Hashanah, you do care, and then it's forbidden. Rabbi Zeira says, no, the reason why it's permitted if it's for Am is because it's likely to be absorbed in the chatzar. And if it goes out of the chatzar, you didn't expect that to happen. You didn't want that to happen. If it's less than that, however, then um, you obviously were okay with it flowing out into Rosh Hashanah, and therefore it would be also for you to send it into the chatzar in the first place. Now the Gemara asks, what's an afkamina? The Gemara says, an afkamina is if the chatzar is not four Amas by four Amas. I mean, our Mishnah said four Amas. We assume that that meant four Amas by four Amas, but it's not, the point is not really that. The point is that you have 16 square Amas. If, let's say, you have eight Amas by two Amas, so that would be a difference. According to Rabbah, it's forbidden because a chutz or that shape is still not usable and you still prefer that the water uh, flow outwards and therefore it's forbidden. According to Rabbi Zeir, however, you uh, do not have enough space in a chutz or that size. You have enough space in a chutz or that size to contain the water and get absorbed and therefore the fact that it flows out is not what you intended and therefore, it's not such an issue. So now, the Gemara has a few machlux over here, a few mm, proofs to try to prove one way or the other. The first proof is from our mission that said that the achsadra, the portico or pavilion, can join the chatzar to a shear of four amas. The Gemara is assuming that if you have a pavilion near your chatzar, it's in the corner. It doesn't really expand the entire chatzar, just stuck off in the corner itself. That's not a full four by four ama. Uh, chatzar then. It's a funny-shaped chatzar. So, according to what we're saying, that a funny-shaped chatzar should still be usher, according to R- R- Rabba. It's only mutter, according to Rabbi Zeira, so there should be a proof to Rabbi Zeira. So, Rabbi Zeira said, no, I'll answer for Rabba. It's talking about where the p- pavilion is actually four amas long and runs along the entire side of the chatzar, and therefore it actually expands it to four amas by four amas, and that's the situation that you have over there. Okay, now the Gemara is another proof. This is a Brisa, which has a similar halacha to our Mishnah, except that this spells out that it's got to be four Amas by four Amas. So again, um, it seems to indicate that it can, it's only okay if it's exactly four Amas by four Amas. If it's a funny shape, it should be usher. That's a Kashan Rabbi Zero who says that a funny shape is also permitted because you do have enough space for it to be absorbed. So Rabbi Zeir says, okay, here's the story. Actually, the machlokis, the, the first 
phrase in the Brisa which said this is actually only Rabbi Loza ben Yaakov and not the Chachamim. The Chachamim would disagree with this entire halacha. Rabbi Loza ben Yaakov who said that you're allowed to pour into the trench and you can assume that it'll be absorbed within four amas. They're the ones who said this part of the Mishnah, and they're the ones who hold that if it'll get absorbed within four amas, it's not a problem. The Chachamim disagree. The Chachamim say, we don't care about absorption. Absorption doesn't help you. We're still afraid that people are going to see it flying out. And therefore, they would not say this, the first part of the Brisa. They wouldn't say the shear of four amas, because absorption is not is not a helpful thing, according to them. So now, the Gemara says, oh, hold on a second. Rabbi Zeir is telling me that the Brisa, the Mishnah, I'm sorry, the Mishnah started off and it said the halacha about four amas, and he understood it as being because of absorption, and therefore he has to say that it's only Rabbi Loza ben Yaakov, and he has to uh, limit it and say it can't be the Chachamim, um, because the Chachamim wouldn't hold of it, in order to do that, in order to make it fit according to his opinion that um, it would be okay even if it's a different shape where you have a bicep that clearly says that it's okay even that it's okay only if it's a square that's four by four in order that he should be able to say that that brisa is really that's really the Chachamim and this is Rebbe Lazar ben Yaakov so why does he have to do that? Why doesn't he just learn a different chat? Let him learn the brisa. Let him learn our mishnah like Rabba. That it's not about absorption, and then it fits in the chachamim, and then he doesn't have to say that the brisa is only the chachamim, and it's not Rabba Lazar ben Yaakov. What does he have to do all this? So the Gemara says because he he he's he's learning this from the language of the mishnah. The mishnah doesn't say four amos by four amos. It says if it's less than four amos, you have a problem. Why do, you, why do you say that? Say if it's four amas by four amas, it's okay. Otherwise not. Why do you have to say less than four amas? That indicates that something's going on over here. What's going on must be that the mission is trying to avoid saying four by four because it doesn't have to be a square. It could be even if it's funny shape. If that's the if that's true, it must be that the Mishnah is holding that funny shape is permitted. And the only reason why that would be is because it could absorb even if it's an odd shape. It's only... Um, If the reason wasn't because of absorption, then it should apply n- n- only in a square. And you, it should not use a language which specifically includes a funny shape. Therefore, the mission that holds, obviously, in its ratio, that the issue is absorption, must be Rebbe Lezeb and Yaakov, who we see later in the Mishnah, clearly says that the issue is absorption, and as long as you have enough space for it to absorb, it's okay. The Chachamim would not say that. The Chachamim would say it's not okay, even if you have enough space to absorb, because it may come out with a lot of strength and a lot of force. So the Gemara asks, well, hold on a second, but the, how could the ratio be Rebbe Lezeb and Yaakov? Right afterwards, the M- Mishnah continues and it quotes and says, Rebbe Lezeb and Yaakov says, obviously up to now it wasn't Rebbe Lezeb and Yaakov. So the... Uh, Gemara answers with its classic uh, emendation, it's chasur mechzachara, it's missing a line. You have to read it as follows. A courtyard which is less than four amas, you're not allowed to pour water into it on Shabbos. Implication being, and this is the missing phrase, but if it is four amas, you could, because of it. Ben Yaakov says, you're allowed to pour into a covered trench four amas because it'll be absorbed. Okay, so we're putting it together with the next halacha of Rebbe Ben Yaakov, and it's all one statement, really. The Gemara now refers back to the Mishnah. We've seen Allah there that the Chachamim say that you are allowed to pour the water onto the roof and then it'll splash off into the trench. The Gemara says this is not like Hananiah. Hananiah holds you not allowed to pour onto a roof because it'll splash around. You don't know where it'll end up. You have to pour uh, directly into the trench that'll take it away or into the pipes on the roof that draw off the water. You can't just pour it onto the roof indiscriminately. Okay, now the Gemara is going to analyze the Yishita of the Chachamim. The Chachamim said that you're allowed to pour onto a roof, like we said. You're not allowed to pour directly into a drainage trench that's going to bring the water, even if it's 100 amas long, and it'll bring the water out into Rosh Hashanah, and it's still forbidden. So the Gemara says, we have a Brisa that says that the only problem is during the summer. During the winter, even if it's a small chatzar, and it's going to flow out, there's no issue. You don't have any of these problems with mutter, you could pour as much water as you want, as many times as you want, in any size, chatzar, during the winter, all isurim are off. So Gemara wants to know why. So uh, Rova says, because during the winter anyway, your entire chatzar is full of mud, and you don't care if it gets a little bit muddier, so if it has a little bit of water there, therefore you have no interest in it flowing out. Gemara says, what do you mean? The Chachamim said that even if it's a hundred amalong trench, 
and it's going to get absorbed in there, and your intent is for sure for it to get absorbed in there, it's still Asr. So obviously the fact that you intend for it to stay in is not a reason to make it Mutter. So the says, no. The Chachamim's problem was that they're afraid people are going to see it coming out forcefully, and they're going to think that you poured it directly into Rosh Hashanah and make it zero. But this is the winter time; it has another effect. Besides the fact that your house is full of mud, during the winter time, there's constantly water flowing through the trenches. It rains, and there's water draining and drain pipes and trenches and all kinds of things. So they're not going to notice that you poured extra water here. It's not an issue. It's not going to be a problem. Rav Nachman here gives another upset. He says, no. What the Bryce meant when it said that during the winter you're allowed to pour, it just meant you're allowed to pour as much as fits. You're allowed to pour, if the hole holds the same, two saw, you could pour two saw, if it holds one saw, you could pour one saw. During the w- winter, that's the halacha. During the summer, however, if it holds two saw, you could put in two saw, but if it holds only one saw, you can't put in even one saw, you can't put anything at all, because we're afraid if we let you put anything in there, you're going to be used to putting in two saw, and you'll put in two saw, it'll overflow, it'll go out into Rosh Hashanah, and people think you pour directly into Rosh Hashanah. During the summer, we're not worried, even if you put two saw, okay, it'll overflow, people will see water flowing all over the place, it's raining, the pipes are flowing all over, there's no issue. That's why we let you pour as much as you want. Says Abaye, if what you're saying is true, so then why do you have to be limited to what fits? Pour as much as you want, it'll flow out, people we'll see. They won't have a problem with it. Okay, we now move on to the next phrase in the uh, Mishnah, and this is the last phrase in the Mishnah, and we will end the parak with this. We're already into Daf Pei Tess. Last phrase says that if two people on upper floors uh, both overlook the same courtyard, and there's a cesspool in there, belongs to one of them, then they can't share it. Only the one who owns the cesspool is allowed to pour water into an So It says, uh, Rava, that's even if they made an air of Chatseris, and um, the Gemara says that the problem is that we're afraid it's going to overflow because there's two people using the same cesspool that it won't fit enough. Says Abaye, why is that a problem? We've seen clearly that there's a halacha. We haven't seen it here, but we've seen elsewhere. There is a halacha that even if it overflows, not also because you didn't intend for it to overflow. You just intended to put in a normal amount and you wanted it to stay. So that that, that it goes out is is not a malachas machshavah. So you didn't do any isr. So what's the problem? Gemara amends Ravas. What he actually said was that if you have an air of chateris, it's okay. The only problem is if there's no air of chateris, and the reason is we're afraid that if he's using this cesspool, he'll go down into the chater and carry his bucket and pour it directly, and that would be aser. That ends daf peches and perek ketzav. Drive the daf is a project of the Grand Woodland School and is presented by Rabbi Yitzchak Landa. Find us on YouTube or subscribe to daily emails by emailing drivethedaf at gmail.com.